let's get started. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge your two special guests, Mr. Jeff Feldman, who is a sleep apnea patient from Miami, Florida, and Ms. Laura Rivera, who is a pulmonary hypertension patient from New York, uh, New York. Laura and Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Both are recovered COVID-19 patients and will share portions of their stories with us today. We'd also like to acknowledge our moderators, our discussants. First, Dr. Doran Doneski, who is a professor in the School of Nursing at Toro University of California and Professor Emeritus at the University of San Francisco, California. Dr. Doneski is an active ATS leader who also previously served on the ATS Board of Directors um, and is just a wonderful friend to patients and friend to par. Dr. Doneski, welcome. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Marie Mesquia Rand, who is co-founder and managing director of the PH Aware Global Association, a wonderful advocate in the PH community and a PAR member. And finally, Mr. Jeff Goldstein, founder and president of the Lung Transplant Foundation, strong patient advocate in the transplant community, and also a longtime member of PAR. Welcome to you all. Thank you, Gordon. So let's start with both Jeffs, uh, Mr. Jeff Goldstein and Jeff uh, Feldman. Uh, Jeff Goldstein, would you like to say a few words and maybe just help set the stage for Mr. Feldman to share with us his experiences with COVID-19 as a sleep apnea patient? Uh, yes, thank you, Courtney. So um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, interest of full disclosure, uh, I've known Mr. Feldman, Jeff Feldman, for some 30, 40 years, personal friend of mine. And uh, unfortunately, um, he is a, uh, well, fortunately, he's a COVID survivor. Unfortunately, he had to experience that. Um, Jeff is also, as Courtney mentioned, a, um, a patient with um, sleep apnea. Uh, he manages that quite well. So um, Jeff, as you and I have uh, uh, discussed, we wanted to share your story today with, uh, with the folks out there uh, about your a little bit about your sleep apnea and and how you deal with that, and as well how it's um, how it's affected your uh, how it's affected by your COVID experience. So, uh, tell us first, if you will, um, how long and how you were diagnosed with sleep apnea. Uh, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea probably eight nine years ago. Uh, I it was diagnosed through a sleep study. Um, and the result of that first test uh, uh, indicated that the uh, the problem was pretty acute. Uh, and then I had a, a subsequent test uh, in the last two years, uh, which indicated that the problem was not as acute as originally diagnosed. For me, what it, it, it fundamentally means to me is I snore, uh, and I scare my wife once in a while because the uh, the, the delay between breaths sometimes is pretty long. I don't experience it, but my, my wife tells me about it. Uh, so uh, when the snoring gets uh, bad, I put the mask on, and when it's not that bad, I frankly, uh, I'm ashamed to say, uh, do, do not use the, uh, the mask. So I'm an intermittent, intermittent mask user. Okay, and your wife... Um, has dealt with that pretty well in spite of the fear that you're going to... I think Jeff's question was your wife has dealt with it um, pretty well in spite of the fear that you may stop breathing in your sleep, and how has it affected you know, her as well? Uh, it, it's affected her. Uh, it, the snoring obviously interrupts her sleep, and when she is waiting for the next breath uh, and it, it's delayed, she gets scared. Uh, but uh, the, the snoring is the real the real complication. I, 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 it has not seeped into my, uh, my, my uh, daily existence. You know, I don't, I don't really have a, um, uh, an awareness uh, of, the, of the problem except when I'm awakened at night by my wife saying you're snoring. All right, so uh, until we get Jeff back, uh, we'll just get right into the, the COVID-19 experience. So, uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Feldman, share with us uh, your COVID-19 experience from diagnosis to recovery. I've heard some of your story, and i got to tell you, you know, it, it, it shakes me a little bit when I hear some of the, 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 the hits and misses that patients have to go through. Um, so I've got to ask you to share a little bit with this audience and take us through uh, methodically how you were diagnosed, what was your experience, and so forth. Okay, 
Uh, so uh, this all started on February 29th, Saturday, February 29th. <clears throat> I went out to Vail uh, for a ski trip. Um, this was really right at the very beginning of uh, uh, this pandemic. Um, I remember being on the airplane, flying out to Vail, seeing people wearing masks, wondering what's, you know, is, is really, do we really need to, do we really need to do this? And um, I, I'm, and I'm being transparent. I'm not proud of any of this, but I'm, I am committed to telling you what was going in my mind because I remember getting on the plane and being very judgmental, like, come on, let's get real. Uh, I uh, skied uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I came home. That was March 5th. Um, and I remember getting back on the airplane and I was a little bit more aware because a lot was happening during that first week of March. And I got back on the plane and uh, this time I was uncomfortable sitting next to the guy, uh, sitting, sitting next to the person uh, uh, to my left because he was sniffling. Uh, in any event, I made it back to Miami, uh, and uh, that was Thursday. Friday night after work, I started feeling a little under the weather, and then Saturday, um, March, I think it was March 7th, um, I, I woke up feeling really, really uh, badly. It was, it was, I knew I was getting sick. So uh, I went to the doctor, uh, and by that time, everyone knew what, COVID was, and I wasn't even allowed in the doctor's office. They just sent me to the ER, and I got to the ER. It was crowded, so I left and went to an urgent care, and uh, they took me in. Uh, I told them where I had been. One of the guys that I was with had been to China, uh, but I didn't know when. So uh, I asked them to test me for COVID, but they would not because I didn't meet criteria. So they gave me a um, flu test, a nasal swab flu test, which was negative. Uh, but they concluded that I had the flu based on a uh, false a false negative and put me on Tamiflu and told me to take the Tamiflu. And after I took the Tamiflu, I could go about my business. So I did the Tamiflu. It was either four or five days. I don't remember exactly. But I know that I, I went back to work uh, the following Wednesday and on Thursday. Uh, in fact, one of the people that I saw on Thursday, if I recall, was, was Jeff Goldstein. But the, I was aware that I was ill, and uh, we, we kept our distance. But uh, I was operating on the premise that I had the flu. Uh, on uh, Friday, which is the sixth, sixth day after that flu test, still not feeling great, but I, I was in Naples, Florida. I have a, a weekend home there. It's still not feeling great. Saturday, not feeling great and actually starting to feel worse. And then Sunday, uh, it was like a brick hit. Uh, my fever was uh, spiking. The fever remained. It was like at nighttime that fever would kick up. And of course, it was Tylenol. And as long as I was taking the Tylenol, uh, it was uh, manageable. Uh, but um, when the, the Tylenol wore off, the fever was there and the fever get, kept getting progressively worse so that by Sunday, uh, I was at 102.5, which led me to call back the urgent care center. Actually, I called a telemedicine at Baptist Hospital in Miami. I told them the story. They asked me to come back to urgent care, and this time I had the full COVID treatment. I felt like a celebrity. I uh, was put into an isolation room, the doctor and the nurse had the full PPE, and now I thought, okay, we're getting somewhere. So they uh, tested me uh, for uh, COVID, and I felt like that was a major milestone. Um, and they took a chest X-ray and found some fluid in my lungs. So I left there with my wife. Um, we both got tested. My, my wife, likewise, came down with the flu just a couple of days after I did, or we thought it was the flu. But we both ended up back at urgent care at the same time, uh, about uh, uh, seven days, eight days later after my, my, my first test, first flu test. And we were both tested on that eighth day uh, with, the, with the COVID on nasal swabs. Uh, they found, as I said, uh, fluid. And they, they sent me home with two antibiotics for uh, for the uh, lung issue, 
they were treating me, I guess, for pneumonia. Uh, and they told me that if things got worse, to return to the hospital. So I left with a diagnosed piece of paper that says suspected COVID. Um, and uh, 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 the pneumonia uh, di diagnosis uh, or, or something to that effect. And, and anyway, when I went home. Uh, and then I woke up Monday, uh, and that was the worst day of the whole experience. Uh, my, I, I literally could not get off the couch. The fatigue and the fever and this delirium that came with the fever were as acute as anything, I, more acute than anything I'd experienced prior to that time. I, I developed a cough, uh, and then really for the balance of that week, I, I was out. And, and the, the hardest part for me, I, I am a type A, I'm, I'm a trial lawyer, uh, I, I do not succumb to sickness easily. Uh, and I, I was resting in my study. I have a couch in there and I have my desk. And I felt the tug of war between the couch and the desk. And I was trying to get the desk to win because I had work to do, uh, but I could not get off the couch. So the, the fatigue uh, really, really put me down for the count. And I, in, I inevitably surrendered uh, to the fatigue because I just, I, I just, I couldn't beat it. Uh, and I remained like that uh, for the balance of that week, all the while waiting for the results of the COVID-19 test and to sort of cut to the bottom line, I waited 11 days for my result. So I, I waited 19 days after symptoms first started to get uh, the, the, uh, the results of, to find out that I had COVID-19. And honestly, by the time I hit the 19th day, I was already on my, the path to recovery. I, I had uh, a little bit of dist distress breathing, uh, but I never struggled uh, to breathe, uh, and the so, just to jump in there for a second, Jeff. So, so how, so how, how did you deal with uh, getting back to work once you started getting a little bit of your strength back? How did you deal with getting back to work, your health routine, and 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 regaining your strength? Okay, so um, it, it was as probably as you could predict. Um, each day, I improved a little. When the fever would go away, I was able to sit at my desk. And when the Tylenol would wear off uh, and I started feeling poor again, I would, you know, I, I would take naps. I would take more, more Tylenol. But it, it, was, it, it was an incremental return. And the, the hardest, there were two components of the return. There was the physical uh, uh, component and then the mental component. And the mental component was the hardest part because, uh, and I'm sure uh, I would venture everyone on, on this webinar uh, would know what I'm talking about because sitting in a house alone uh, is it, it challenges your desire uh, to work. Uh, so, uh, and, and when you're sick, it makes it that much more challenging. So, I, I had to get my mind back to the point where uh, I, I I always needed I always knew that I needed to work, but wanting to work was a different story. And I and I had to push myself back to the point where I, I was out of that I'm sick mentality and I can, I can start returning to a normal protocol. But then on the physical side, um, the, the fever at night still kept coming back. It kept getting better, uh, but the nighttime was the devil. And that, that fever came back and uh, there were, uh, I, I went from high fever with drenching night sweats uh, uh, to just uh, intermittent fever, and then ultimately that went away, and then I was left with a cough for a couple of weeks, and that that has now uh, disappeared. So the 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 return to work uh, was um, gradual, and uh, and it was both mental and physical. So, and, and I'm going to ask um, Laura this too when we get to her, but uh, are, are you concerned at all, um, uh, Jeff, about immunity and infection? Uh, I'm not. Um, again, I may be naive, but um, my, the, the silver lining in all of this is I had it. And so I'm done with it. Um, it. It was a horrible experience. It was honestly the worst illness I think I've ever had. 
uh, and I, I don't get sick uh, too often. Uh, but this, this, one, this one threw me for a loop, but I survived it. Uh, and uh, I, I have uh, returned to my normal routine. Um, I wear the mask uh, when I'm in public, uh, uh, but more out of respect for others than a sense that, that I need it. Um, and uh, I'm not afraid of getting it again. And that, that may be naivety on my part, but it has allowed me to uh, return to exercise and return to work. And I haven't had any real, I haven't had any real issues. I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't fallen back. Uh, I haven't relapsed in, in any way, no symptoms. Okay. So uh, obviously we have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, we have some questions from the audience and we'll get to all of that. Um, and we want to get to Laura first. But I saw uh, Dr. Dineski's uh, face uh, a couple of times that you were speaking there, Jeff. I, I wonder, uh, Doran, if you have any initial questions for Jeff. We'll double back with him, obviously, after we have Laura speak. But if, do you have any initial thoughts or questions as you were hearing his story? Well, I mostly have gratitude, Jeff, um, for you to share your story. And it explained everything when you said you're a trial lawyer because you put together your story in such a succinct way. I felt like I was just reading a, a medical report with all the details. So thank you very much. And I think I you it. really put a face and a heart to what this experience is about. It's, um, I could I could almost experience it with you. You were so vivid in the description. And also, I'm just so grateful that even with an underlying um, pulmonary issue, sleep apnea issue, that you were able to recover as well as you have. Um, I think that really gives hope for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dineski. Um, so we want to switch gears now when we're going to bring in uh, Marie uh, Mesquiteran from the uh, PH uh, uh, Aware Global Association and Laura Rivera, who was in the epicenter of it all here in New York. So, Marie, if you don't mind, if you can uh, help uh, us and uh, uh, help Laura walk us through her experiences with pulmonary hypertension and COVID. Yeah, and thank you very much for doing this today. I think uh, Laura's story is extremely important. Um, I So Laura has pulmonary hypertension, which is a rare lung disease affecting, affecting the arteries of the lungs, and um, it's pretty serious, but um, also has been an asthmatic for a long time, right, Laura? Um, so About I'm, 10 years. Yeah, and um, I'd like for Laura, I think it's a really interesting journey. I don't know which, you were, which she was diagnosed with first, but to have two uh, lung diseases simultaneously and becoming COVID positive, um, and in addition to that, Laura is studying to become an RN, a nurse, so she's got some medical knowledge behind her. So I'm interested in, I think it's very interesting for everybody to see the picture from someone who has, um, you're pretty well trained when you have conditions like pulmonary hypertension, you're very knowledgeable, but she also has a medical background and, um, and discovered she was COVID positive. So Laura, I'd love for you to tell us that journey. Um, it's really so thank you for having me. Um, this year marks 25 years of being diagnosed with pH, and I've been um, diagnosed with asthma for 10 years. My husband got sick with COVID first. Now, we couldn't confirm his diagnosis because there weren't enough um, tests here in New York, and he didn't meet the criteria. So when he started showing symptoms, I right away called my pulmonary hypertension doctor and um, she said, well, chances are that you've already been exposed. So just, you know, isolate him, try to stay away from him and also watch yourself for symptoms, high fever, coughing. So um, I did notice that a week before I started showing the fever and my fevers were low grade, they weren't high as the highest they got were were like 100.3 so but I did have a, a headache a, a headache that would not go away no matter what I took so um I the weekend passed and I 
took care of my husband and watched for um, symptoms. I woke up that Monday morning and I said, I don't feel right. There's something wrong. I was exhausted. I could not get out off the couch where I was staying. It was like like a ton of bricks had hit me. My body ached something crazy. I called my um, pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension doctor again. I was also having chills and night sweats, but no fevers at that point. So she said, okay, we're going to treat you with z pack and keep watching. Keep watching the symptoms. Tuesday morning, I woke up and um, my, my body ached like someone had beaten me. And I did have a low-grade fever. So um, at that point, I called my asthma, my asthma doctor, my pulmonologist, and he said, you know what? Go to the emergency room. You need to get tested. Your husband probably has this. You got it. I don't want anything, you know, to you keep declining. Go to the emergency room. So my husband drove me down to the emergency room at, Cor at Cornell, and once there, they, you know, they triage you, right? So they did x-rays, blood work. They made me do um, a, a, a march in place thing type thing so they can monitor my oxygen levels to see how far they dropped and how quickly they went back up to normal. I was, everything was normal. My O2 sets were normal. My temperature, because I had already taken Tylenol, was back down to normal. So they were ready to let me go home. They were ready to release me. So they called my pulmonologist, and I could hear him screaming because I was my I was seated in front of the doctor's station. And he was like, no, you can't let her go. She needs to get tested. So the attending was like, the only way we can test her is if we admit her. So the doctor said, admit her then. I don't care. You need to admit her. So they decided that they were going to admit me. But at that point, they had already seen my x-ray results, which showed I had viral pneumonia. And they said, oh, no, um, you have COVID. We just need to confirm we're admitting you and we're going to swab you, which is what they did. Um, they usually put me on the cardiac floor, but they, because they were waiting for the results um, of the COVID test to come back, I was placed on another floor in isolation by myself. So... Once we got the results, the it took 24 hours to get those results, by the way. 24 hours, they started me right away on um, doxycycline and um, Pacnil. And I was, um, my, my O2 sats never went down past 85, which is sometimes normal for me when I catch a cold. I didn't have fevers. It was just, you know, the only really bad symptoms I can say I had was I lost my sense of taste and smell, and that was gone for like six weeks. Um, they kept me in the hospital for five days because they couldn't, they were going to release me sooner, but because there's a shortage on platinum now, um, they decided to just keep me there, let, let me just take my course and then really, you know, discharge me, which is what they did. Um, I will say that once I got home, uh, they did send me home with um, uh, blood thinners. They they recommended I do blood thinners for like uh, 14 days. I was exhausted. The exhaustion also was crazy. I don't think I've ever slept as much as I as when I was sick with COVID. Like for the for two weeks, I could not get out of bed. I would force myself. Only because my pH doctor would call me and, and say, you need to get up. You need to go walk around. You need to exercise because that's not good for your lungs either. You're just laying there, you know. So I would force myself to get up and walk around the apartment because I couldn't go outside. Um, I had, you know, schoolwork. I couldn't do anything because I just wasn't in the right frame of mind to be able to concentrate on sitting there to do work, schoolwork. And um, it took, it took like two to three weeks for me to say, okay, I'm back to normal. So, Marie, uh, do do you have any thoughts as you hear Laura's um, Laura's journey there, particularly because you know she was in New York, the epicenter of it, and as it was exploding, and and, and sort of the mental anguish of having to hear how bad it is, in, you know, in New York every day as as a patient. 
you know, knowing that you also have pH, you know, from, from your experience dealing with pH patients, you know, how, how are people prepared uh, to deal with this kind of thing, Marie, from your, from your experience? Well, I feel like, and Laura's been in the pH space for a long time, um, ju just as I, I have been because of my daughter, Chloe, but I feel like um, you, you become your own best advocate. And my bet is that I think, Laura, you probably weren't leaving that ER. I, I don't think that was going to happen. I don't think you would have gone back and forth too many times. I think once you were there, you were staying. And I think that's one of the things that we learn from being ill like this is that um, you, you have to self-advocate. And in especially a pandemic where people have no idea what's really happening, it's so chaotic. I mean, it's indescribably chaotic here in New York. Um, that um, to know to, to stay. And what was interesting to me was that it, it was the pulmonologist for, for asthma that was more adamant about you staying than your pH specialist because you're probably able to manage your pH pretty well at home. Right, yes. And his fear was that, it, you know, because it affects the lungs, it would kick up my asthma, something awful. So. And did that scares as you listen to Laura's uh, story, uh, what, what, what jumps out at you about her experience? Well, I'm really interested, Laura. Two parts. One is, and, and I don't know exactly what your timing was when you were hospitalized, but was it far enough into the pandemic that you knew how, um, like, what was your emotional response to being hospitalized? And did you know kind of the background and on what was happening with the pandemic and hospitalizations and what what was your experience emotionally and then also with your husband and your family? I'm assuming they probably weren't able to visit you in the hospital. And so what was the interpersonal dynamics and how did you and your family deal with the stress? So this all happened end of March, right when the pandemic was beginning to start. It started like around the middle of March here in, in New York. Um, so in the beginning, you know, I was anxious because I said, oh, if I get sick, something bad's going to happen to me because that's all you hear about all these patients with underlying conditions passing away. Um, but it's funny because once I was in the hospital and that they confirmed me with COVID, I was actually calm because I said, okay, so if something's going to happen to me, I'm at the right place for them to take care of me. I'm not home and having to rely on an ambulance to take me anywhere. Um, my, my husband was really sick, so he was he was in and out. Like he wasn't he I, he knew I was I was sick with this, but I don't think because of the fact that he did run the high fevers, he wasn't all there. Um, so, and then he had my father-in-law, who also lives with us, got sick, and he was taken into the hospital too. So my husband was home alone. Like, oh my god, I got everybody here sick, but um. You know, it, it was it was kind of worrisome for them because no one could come and see me. They had to rely on me calling them. And sometimes because I would sleep so much, I would not pick up the phone and I, I wouldn't call them. So they would already, like, they would get in a panic, like, oh, she, she's, she took a turn for the worse. And, you know, but, um, and I will tell you, I've never experienced something like this when I've stayed in the hospital. The nurses hardly came in. They, you know, they would only come in to give medication or to deliver food. That's it. You know, the the janitors or, or would come in to pick up the garbage, but they wouldn't bother. They wouldn't come in, and it would take them such a long time to get ready to come into the room with, you know, uh, you mm -hmm. know, getting themselves ready. I had never in my life, and I've been in and out of the hospital so many times, experienced something like that. Like, it felt lonely. Yeah, because you're alone in a room mm -hmm. with nobody but the TV, and you're too tired to talk, but you also want company, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it was it was something that I will never forget because I've never experienced that at all when I stay mm -hmm. at a in the hospital. She yeah. she makes a great wow. point, Doctor Dineski. You know, talking about her mental state and her feeling lonely. I would presume probably, even though you know, Laura said she 
you know, Laura, you, you did say you, you weren't you weren't as anxious because you felt like you're in the right place. But Dr. Vanessa, right. can you talk to a patient's mental state uh, in general, you know, once they've sort of come to grips with, okay, now I know what I'm facing, now where do we go from here? Well, I think it's so individual for every patient. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that, that Jeff mentioned sitting laying on the couch and feeling called back to work, but completely unable to do that. So that was kind of his experience where Laura felt at peace. It sounds like you were almost too sick and your husband was almost too sick to even worry about anything for much of the time. Um, but then I've had some patients out here in California where maybe, especially early on, we had some of the um, Princess Cruz patients who weren't that ill but they had that same experience that you're describing where nobody would come into the room because it took so much time and attention to to use the personal protective equipment. And so they felt very lonely and very kind of abandoned. And um, But there again, people people cope with that very differently. Some people kind of enjoy the time to read and, you know, we really tried to get them extra you know, disposable novels to read and things, and, and some of them really enjoyed it, and others were pretty anxious and kind of climbing the walls and so forth. So I think it really has to do with a person's personality and pre-existing coping strategies. Laura, it sounds like you've been in the hospital a lot, so you probably have kind of set up for yourself ways to cope when that happens. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of having strong coping strategies when things are going well so that you have more of a um, a reserve of coping strategies that you can call on when when you're experiencing illness like this. So double back to Jeff for a second. Uh, you know, one of the questions, I don't know, Judy, Judy, if you're on, if, if you can hear me. One of the questions, Judy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah, so, so my colleague Judy Korn here uh, has a question for you about her symptoms. Judy, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious, um, actually for, for both um, people who survived COVID, which which thank goodness you're here with us, um, I'm just curious early on, how, what symptoms did you have that made you think, wow, this is really something, this is not just the flu, a bad cold, or, or whatever. What you know? Did you experience any shortness of breath at the beginning, or you know what 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 did you have, um, and and how did it unfold over time? How long did it take for for you to have you know the full blown symptoms of you know perhaps fever and night sweats and um, you know other other the, the cough that eventually came on. The, the 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 worst of it was the second week. The second week was just absolutely brutal. The first week uh, felt like the flu. The onset, I, I fl remember I flew out on Saturday the 29th, came home on Thursday, I think the 5th. Uh, I felt fine on Thursday. Friday, after work, heading to dinner, started feeling a little funky. You know, just I knew something mm -hmm. wasn't right. And then Saturday morning I woke up. I had no energy, uh, so. Um, but th did I know that I had COVID at that point? No, I thought maybe I was coming down. I didn't think it was a cold. I thought it was the flu. Uh, but because the COVID thing was hanging out there, I wanted to get tested. But they dismissed it. Uh, and and I I have to say, um, I have two two points of view on that. I'm glad in a way I didn't know with certainty because. If I was, if I knew while I was as sick as I was, I would have been more worried. Uh, but on the other hand, because they told me that I had the flu, even though there was a, a false a, or a negative result, uh, I, I dismissed COVID and went back to work and exposed others who, thank God, did not get it. Um, so, you know, I just, I just sort of offer, offer, offer that. Uh, but uh, the real... I knew something was wrong um, eight days later on that, that, that following Sunday when my fever was still really going, had spiked above 102. Uh, like Laura, my fever hung around 100, 101. Um, but when it went over 102, 
uh, I knew something was up and the fatigue was getting worse. And that and that's when I felt like that Sunday night when I returned to urgent care, um, I, I felt that I, I had it. Uh, but then, of course, I waited 11 days after that point to find out. I was going to say, you know, that it sort of highlights the idea that a, that a comprehensive and accurate testing strategy for everybody is, is sorely needed. And, you know, without that, you're, you're sort of, you don't know what you're doing. You know, you, you really don't, you could easily expose other people without knowing it. So, what, um, I, what I felt was wrong, what I felt was wrong was the doctors defaulting into a diagnosis because I didn't meet criteria to do the test that everybody knew that I should have gotten. So to send me out of there, uh, well, you, you know, flu, flu says, you, the test says you're negative, but we can't give you COVID, so we can't go there. So we're, we're going to conclude that you have the flu, take Tamiflu. That's crazy. That was, that was irresponsible. Uh, one, of the questions uh, from the, from one of the questions from the audience, Jeff, was that, uh, is, is, did the Tamiflu help at all? Someone yes. Yeah, I think it did, actually. Um, it, it, did, it, it didn't kill it. Uh, but I was I was feeling better in the in the in the days that I was using it to the point where I felt well enough to, to go back to go back to work l later later that week. Thank you. We want to welcome Jeff Goldstein back. Took a while, but you're back with us, my friend, and we certainly appreciate you being back with us. We took the liberty of going through some of the um, most of the early questions with uh, Mr. Feldman, and we're sort of taking some questions from the audience. I want to double back to Laura again. Um, uh, again, so talking about the New York pandemonium that was going on in New York City and how crazy it was, uh, how 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 worried were you about immunity and reinfection? I am actually not worried about it at all because I feel like okay, I got it. I do have the antibodies for it. I was tested, so I you know, and my doctors are saying chances are you're you're going to be good for a few months up to a year. You know, again, nothing is really known about this, you know, virus. So I'm also very careful going out, not because, not for me, but for others, because of the fact that I did already have it. I do not want to expose anybody else. So, um, but I, you know, I'm really not thinking about it as much as I was before I got sick where I was going nuts, disinfecting everything, and it was really giving me bad anxiety. Once we all got mm -hmm. sick here in, in my household, it was like, eh, we all got it, so we're good now. We can, you know, go out and don't worry about taking your shoes off or, you know, disinfecting the groceries. You know, I'm ve I've, I've become very slack about that. Marie, what are you hearing from your patients uh, in the, in the PH community, what are you hearing in general about the likelihood, the numbers of, of patients being infected? Do, do you think that because of some of the regimen that the, the PH patients, who are generally engaged patients to begin with, uh, do you think that may have some effect on the numbers that we have seen or are, that we're not seeing for, for PH patients getting infected with COVID? It's an interesting thing that's happening because we are seeing very few pH patients diagnosed with COVID. We're, um, we're um, not hearing much about it at all. We're actually, we've actually been speaking from center to center and finding zero patients um, quite often. Um, Laura is actually one of the unusual cases. Um, and I heard one of the pH specialists say the other day, um, that uh, sheltering in place is a pH patient's superpower because they have a, they have a sick a disease that they can get very sick very easily. Um, they tend to know how to, and Laura, I don't know what medications you are, but some of the medications require masking and gloving before you mix your meds and so. And so there's this system that they're kind of used to that seems to be working really nicely right now. There's also some talk, some conversation about some of the pH medications, the more serious ones, not things like Plaquenil, um, but some of the, um, there's some, there are already some papers out there talking about how some of the medications may actually be helping pH patients not get um, COVID. Uh, and so um, we're finding that the pH docs are really banding together and working really hard to see if um, that information stands true. 
or hoping to hear that pretty pretty soon because what it will do is it will effectively help people who are hospitalized um, it's not it, it, and um, maybe change the course of the way that, just as we saw a pretty a pretty um, interesting change between when patients were first diagnosed and almost immediately put on vents and now we're not that's being held off more often um, supine positioning so we're seeing that there's a lot of uh, the, you know make we're making a different kind of sense out of it um, and the pH specialists in particular are doing a lot of work in that area all right so this was in regards to uh, Jeff uh, Feldman um, you mentioned early on early on in your uh, discussion that you and you admittedly uh, sporadically use your uh, your CPAP your mask mm -hmm. um, and so there was a, a comment from one of the, of the healthcare providers here online about that. Um, if you're concerned at all with your low oxygen saturation levels, because it can lead to pH. Dr. Doneski, do you have any thoughts about adherence? Um, <laughs> I know Jeff admittedly said he's not as uh, good as adherent as he probably should be with his mask. Um, but can that, you know, increase your pH and certainly for for other diseases. Well, I am a big fan of adherence to mask for for OSA, and um, I bet that's not news to to Jeff Feldman. Um, but yeah, so often when we're sleeping, especially in a deep sleep, and we might even feel fine. Um, but there are things happening physiologically in our body. Often, our heart rate slows. Our respiratory rate slows. In your case, you've mentioned that you have the snoring and the occasional apnea episodes. Um, but that is stressing your heart and your lungs. And the mask really does a wonderful job of changing those physiological parameters, even if you don't really feel it. And actually, and I've had patients who get headaches and hadn't put two and two together. And when they start wearing their mask regularly, the headaches go away. So sometimes there are symptoms that you don't even recognize are happening. There's even some research linking sleep quality with um, diabetes and the way that your body processes sugar with hunger, overeating. So, you know, we're learning so much more about what happens in sleep and the value of sleep for our bodies. And um, so often, we we can't tell based on when we're awake what's happening physiologically while we're asleep. But you've had the benefit of that polysomnography where they have measured all physiologically what's going on when you sleep. So I would vote for going ahead and using the mask, not just waiting for your wife to tell you to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring in Jeff Ghost in here for a second. And thank you, Dr. Nasky. And um uh, and this may be a topic, but I, I, I think you may be able to shed, you know, some of your expertise here. You know, you know, what are you hearing? What are your thoughts with regards to your transplantation, transplant world? And a lot of things has um, slowed down since, obviously, a lot of centers have closed. Um, what are your thoughts with regards to, you know, um, you know, patients awaiting transplant and how the, the COVID-19 has impacted um um, some of what's happening in this in this area. Uh, thank you, Courtney. Yes, again, I apologize. We got knocked off here. Another thunderstorm here in South Florida. Um, so much like uh, Marie's uh, patient community, um, lung transplant recipients, uh, lungs are the only organs that are exposed to the outside environment, and part of our uh, post-transplant survival is living like we're living under COVID. Um, you know, uh, uh, staying away from people. Uh, we don't all wear masks all the time, uh, other than perhaps when we're at clinics, but we're very careful about uh, exposure and, um, and maintaining a, um, uh, a lifestyle that uh, keeps us to some degree secluded. Um, so uh, there are some cases out there of, of transplant recipients uh, having um, actually suffered from COVID, um, the few that I'm aware of um, have actually uh, managed it quite well. Uh, there are some thoughts about the, some of the meds, like Berea's indicated, 
uh, some of the meds that we might take uh, may have some ameliorative effect on the COVID virus. Um, still not proven, but um, um, it, it seems to be uh, not a significant issue for post-transplant patients uh, because of the way we're living. However, what is most concerning for our community, particularly and obviously the pre-transplant community, is the effect it's had on uh, not just lung transplants, but all transplants, right? All solid organs being transplanted. Kidney transplants are substantially down. Uh, lungs are uh, also substantially down. Um, there are a few centers who continue to transplant. They have some developed some pretty strict, uh, you know, protocols in dealing with uh, a COVID uh, uh, organ uh, donor um, and in an effort to maintain, you know, um, some very safe uh, and strict procedures. Uh, it seems to have worked pretty well, um, but um, the number of transplants have been reduced substantially, and what, uh, what concerns uh, me about that is the, uh, what UNOS refers to as death while waiting. So there are patients who are undoubtedly uh, passing because um, there's not enough, there's always not enough organs available, but there's, you know, not enough organs available and the fear of transplanting a, um, a, a COVID uh, infected organ is, is pretty high and, and rightly so. So it's a real concern. Thank you very much, Jeff. You know, I want to go back to uh, Jeff Feldman and, and Laura again, you know, and to talk about your experiences with the healthcare system. You know, Laura, you've been, you know, involved with the healthcare system for a long time, um, and Jeff, uh, uh, to some extent as well, you were diagnosed many years before with um, sleep apnea. Let me start with Laura. From your experience this time around with COVID, as opposed to when you were being treated for asthma or formula hypertension, what was most glaring um, about your interaction with the healthcare system this go around, what what bothered you the most? What did you think was good, or what was not so good with with your interactions this time? What I found shocking is that they did not want to test me, even though I have underlying lung diseases that could um, eventually, if you know, if I you know gotten worse, I could have easily it could have gone really gotten really bad for me and they you know being in, in the ER and they were ready to let me just let me go home without testing me because of the fact that I did not meet criteria also because all my vitals were fine and normal and I was breathing okay without oxygen I found that to be alarming I also when my husband got sick and I tried to get him tested I couldn't and my argument with, you know, um, I did call 311 here, which is, I guess, the, the New York um, City Health hotline that they give you for COVID to call 311 and they'll direct you to a, a testing center. And when I spoke to someone, even though I made the argument, we need to know if he has COVID for, me, for my say, own knowing, well-being, they wouldn't do it. Dr. Mm -hmm. Dennis, do you think that's a result of the stress of the healthcare system? Do you think it's a result of the fog of war? Everything was happening so quickly, so fast. Do you think it's regional because New York was exploding? What are your thoughts on, on that, on Laura's comments? Well, it just breaks my heart. And I just, as you were talking, Laura, I just thought I, I must acknowledge both of you for being active consumers of healthcare and taking your own. I always tell my patients they are the CEOs of their health and we are all your consultants. And, it, and I really love to hear that you both took your health in your own hands and didn't take no for an answer until you got the care you needed, even though you both had multiple barriers and that breaks my heart. And I wish it was only the fog of war, but I've seen it here in California and in my area, which is the suburbs outside of San Francisco. We're still waiting for the surge. We really have not had, you know, we really truly have flattened the curve. And even in this lack of stress on the healthcare system, I've been hearing the same stories here locally, 
where people clearly had symptoms that at the time were not considered the, the primary symptoms and were declined testing and clearly had it and then were tested later and maybe they were already recovered. Um, I, I am hoping, you know, I keep seeing parallels between this current uh, crisis and when I first came into nursing, which was in the late 80s when HIV was first coming on the scene, and there was so much confusion, and I remember um, meeting people who wouldn't even go grocery shopping because they were afraid they were going to get HIV from the produce, and I mean, there was so much misunderstanding at that point, and now, um, you know, we as a society have learned how to support those with HIV and how not to be completely um, crazy about it. And um, and it strikes me that there has to be a path there with COVID as well. But right now, um, it, it, it really breaks my heart that there are people who are maybe not as active consumers as the two of you are who have really had negative outcomes because of this confusion in the healthcare system. So um, unfortunately, we can't just blame it on the over overwhelmed healthcare like in New York. I think it's the national. And I'm just really, really hoping that we will collectively learn the lessons so that we don't repeat this again. Thank you, Dr. Dneski. Jeff Feldman down there in Miami, and you're, you're with your type A personality, and I gather that you had some barriers as well. What really struck you as, you know, uh, the ordinary could have been better with the experience you have you had with the, the healthcare system down there? Uh, two points. How does the United States government co-opt the judgment of a physician? How does the United States government tell a physician what they can test for or what they can't test for. That is absurd. That was absolutely absurd. But what was even worse, second point, is that the doctor had to come up with a diagnosis. So even though I had a negative flu test, I walked out with the flu because they had no other way of moving past that diagnosis. That was irresponsible. And so, and they, I was lucky. I have an assistant who's in her 60s. I have a partner who's in her 50s. And they, they sent me back. They told me, take the Tamiflu, and when you finish it, you're feeling better, go back to work, which is what I did. And, and that, was, that was just completely irresponsible. So this notion in the future that the government can dictate what a doctor can test for, somebody needs to speak up about that. But... Just because the government tells you that you can't give a patient a test doesn't mean you send the doctor or send the patient home with a diagnosis that your test says he doesn't have. That, that, those are my observations. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, Laura, I, I don't recall if Jeff said this happened with him, but Laura, you lost your sense of taste and smell. And the question from the audience was, did that happen early on? Was it in your first week or so? When, when did that happen as far as your symptoms? That happened um, into my second week, into my second week. My first week was, it wasn't bad at all. That, that was the first, you know, when I was in the hospital. So I felt fine. When I came home, I lost my sense of taste and smell. I started coughing. My, uh, I started having to use my oxygen more because I couldn't really catch my breath. Um, but, um, that, the, the loss of taste of, um, the loss of taste and smell lasted for six weeks and my cough just, I'm going to say over the weekend stopped. I stopped. Wow. All right. Well, so we, we I mean, there's so much more that we could unpack here and, you know, um, you know, in the interest of time, I want to, um, you know, spend just a moment. Um, or two uh, here uh, to talk to the audience a little bit about some of the resources that the ATS um, has. As you can see on my screen there, um, the ATS has a resource website set up, uh, thoracic.org slash COVID um, slash index. Uh, it talks about uh, all the touch points that the ATS um, uh, has in terms of trying to uh, 
uh, get information out there, not only to the ATS members, but also to the general public and to patients and families. Uh, we're doing a lot with our advocacy of uh, uh, folks down there in D.C., uh, our four ATS journals, uh, ATS statements, and official documents. Uh, lots of clinician resources are listed, listed there. Uh, links to tons of websites, uh, webinars, just like the one that we're doing right now, but also webinars from our partners, um, such as uh, Maurice Page Aware or Jeff's Lung Transplant Foundation and others. Uh, a lot of our ATS chapters also has resources as well. And I would just want to take a second just to uh, 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 let the audience know that uh, all of the PAR members are the ATS Public Advisory Roundtable patient advocacy, advocacy partners, including Jeff uh, Goldstein and the Lung Transplant Foundation, and Marie and the PHO, we are Global Association, uh, are part of this PAR group, including some of the folks that, and, and that you see there on the screen, allergy and asthma, sleep, pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, cystic fibrosis, LAM, tuberous sclerosis, um, rare uh, lung disorders such as uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia or tuberous sclerosis um, are some of the other ones from Ansgar Pudlock. And uh, we will spend some time as we go forward in the next weeks and months talking to some other patients uh, uh, from these organizations as well who may have had um, contact with um, COVID-19. So with that said, we're up against the top of the hour, and I want to ask uh, the, uh, Laura if you have any final thoughts that you have the audience with today. Um, just, again, you have to be your own advocate and um, listen to your body. And if, you know, don't take no financial, we really feel you've been exposed and you do have, you, you, you know, symptoms of COVID. I don't think it's happening now here in New York that they're willing to test you now. You don't have to have symptoms or anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's much easier now to get tested. But, you know, and take the proper precautions. Thank you. And Jeff Feldman, do you have any uh, parting thoughts to leave with the uh, audience today? Uh, just uh, thanks for uh, inviting me, and thank you to all of the healthcare practitioners who uh, have done and keep doing what they're doing. And uh, Dr. Doneski, thank you so much uh, for being our uh, scientific expert on the call today. Do you have any thoughts for the audience and also for the, uh, the both patients today? Uh, yeah, I just want to really draw attention on the ATS website. There are really good patient and family resources as well. And I tore this one out of one of our journals. This is just an example. There's a whole patient family education um, area in general about lung pulmonary um, sleep and critical care and also about COVID specifically. And I also, to Laura, I want to give you a personal invitation to join the American Thoracic Society. We have a very active nursing assembly mm -hmm. and um, I think you can join for cheap or free as a student so please um, come join us as a nursing student we'd love to have you uh -huh. in the nursing assembly thank you I look at that you can reach out to us uh, Laura we can uh, we can uh, try to facilitate all right uh, Marie you had some parting thoughts that you wanted to leave the audience with today it actually uh, it, it comes right after uh, your comment um, I find that people um, in general are, are experiencing a great deal of anxiety from what we spoken about on the news, and I am continually referring people back to the ATS because I say to them, you're going to hear real information here, um, and I've, I'm hoping that that message gets out very clearly. There is so much chaos and so much going on in the general news that it's always smart to come back to the places where so many groups of very smart people are working together to really understand this disease. So I'm grateful to the ATS for all of this work that I get to be included in, but also for anybody out there who really needs to be properly informed. It's a good idea to keep yourself calm by reading the proper things. Thank you, Marie. And Jeff, any uh, parting thoughts for the audience today? Thank you, Cordy. Um, I, thank you for allowing us to participate. I, I would echo very much what Marie has just shared. Our, our patient population, uh, you know, sees a lot of different information out there. Uh, so I would urge anybody who's listening to, uh, uh, one, be sure that the sources you're getting your information from is, is uh, uh, smart, accurate, and intelligent. Um, the ATS uh, patient information series that uh, Dr. Dineski was referring to is a great 
uh, 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 resource, as well as, of course, the ATS uh, regular updates on COVID. Um, the Lung Transplant Foundation, uh, our Facebook site, uh, posts uh, some regular information from the CDC and UNOS, uh, particularly in reference to transplant. That might be helpful for some of the uh, some of our community and maybe some other folks out there who are listening. Um, so, um, other than that, I would say uh, thank you, Courtney, for the opportunity to share this. Uh, Jeff, my personal friend, thank you for the time. Uh, Laura, as well, hearing from from both of you. All right, and so on behalf of the ATS, we'd like to thank both uh, 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 Jeff Feldman and Laura Rivera for sharing their stories with us today. Uh, we'd also certainly like to thank Dr. Doran Doneski for sharing her uh, clinical expertise, and certainly our partners, uh, Marie Mesquiaran and Jeff Goldstein, who are wonderful partner, patient advocate partner, advocacy partners for the ATS. This webinar was recorded. We'll make it available within 48 hours on the website. We'll also send a link out to everyone who registered for this so we'll be able to review this webinar again. Again, thank you for your time today, Laura uh, and Jeff Feldman. We wish you all the best, and thank you, everyone, and take care.